All right. Uh, so today we are going to talk about Streamlet, uh, textbook Streamlet blockchains. Uh, this is this paper is by Benjamin Chen and Elaine Shi at from Cornell University. So let's get started. Uh, let's let's just take a brief look at uh, what blockchain protocols are. So uh, blockchain protocols are uh, concerned with the application that is a uh, blockchain. So uh, simply stated, blockchain is a blob of transactions which contains the hash of its parent block and uh, that is a mechanism to provide non-repudiation. So when a bunch of nodes get together to, uh, to decide what the next block would be that would be added to the blockchain, then uh, the problem of agreement comes in. So the blockchain protocols uh, fundamentally uh, are consensus protocols. So if uh, you have just uh, read like Twitter or just blogs or just heard about blockchain protocols, you would think that uh, there are two types of blockchain protocols. First is the proof of work blockchain protocols where you uh, burn CPU cycles to generate a hash with a certain number of zeros in front of it. And uh, uh, that is the mechanism that's used to uh, build the protocol. And on the other hand, you have these newer proof of stake protocols. The uh, idea is that uh, proof of work consumes too much energy. So your participation in the protocol is controlled by the amount of stake that you hold. So this stake could be uh, the number of cryptocurrencies you have as compared to the total uh, cryptocurrency assets in the, uh, in, in the system. But uh, these are basically civil control mechanisms and the actual consensus protocols are uh, one of them is the extending the longest chain with the most prominent of which is the Nakamoto consensus, which is used in Bitcoin. And uh, with proof of stake, uh, if you look, look under the hood, uh, most of the protocols that are built uh, to support proof of stake are, uh, are these traditional Byzantine protocols. So ideally you can, uh, you can basically combine proof of work or proof of stake. You can have combinations with the, the consensus protocols and that would uh, give you a new category of uh, blockchain protocol. But uh, today uh, we are going to focus on proof of stake. So this is also colloquially called a permissioned model. So in the permission model, uh, we have a known set of users. So on the right hand, you can see all these users and uh, we actually know uh, because we have allotted uh, stakes to them. And uh, they basically have their own version of the blockchain. Uh, each of these uh, have their own, uh, uh, own view of the overall blockchain. And uh, the consistency rule as applied to this is uh, essentially that all the blockchains at each node should share the same prefix. So simply stated, like everyone should see the same blockchain. And the liveness property as applied to uh, the, this model is basically that you should be able to add more blocks to the blockchain then you can add, you can introduce malicious users uh, the nodes could be faulty they could lie you know and uh, they could just uh, not participate in the in the system and then you can have some network faults the messages may be reordered or maybe just dropped altogether so this uh, this is not as not really a new problem but uh, this is the these are the sort of faults that make consensus hard. So to, uh, to kind of understand Streamlight, let's make, a, uh, make an argument for simplicity. So most of the blockchain protocols uh, of the traditional BFT blockchain protocols, they introduce a lot of, uh, a, a, lot of comp uh, a, a lot of complexity uh, within themselves. Even protocols uh, which just do propose and vote and in the fastest case might just be hiding that complexity 
when the fault actually occurs. So for example, Ziziva, you have a simple proposed vote model. However, if there is an actual fault or a network fault partition, then in that case, uh, you have this uh, uh, slow recovery mechanisms that are really complicated. And it might deter some people from uh, implementing the protocol or studying it all together. And even like even if we forget uh, the BFT protocol, the first or uh, the first protocol like Paxos that that was built for the crash fault tolerant model had to be followed by a lot of papers to really understand the protocol. Uh, although it's arguable, I would say uh, until Raft came along, which uh, looked at Paxos from a view of uh, the state machine replication problem and uh, uh, really focused on building an ordered set of logs. Until then, it, the Paxos wasn't really uh, 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 well uh, understood or uh, well uh, or as widely implemented for sure. Uh, um, in open source systems. And uh, the authors basically make a similar argument for BFT that uh, BFT protocols could, if, if they could be studied from the, the perspective of the application of building blockchains, then they could be understand, uh, then they could be understood and implemented more widely. So the simplest of these protocols is essentially streamlet. That's what the authors uh, argue. And uh, this is uh, sort of the focus of uh, building streamlet. It's not uh, achieving really high performance or it's not about uh, achieving like some uh, unique reliability guarantees, but the premise of the paper is essentially to get simplicity. And the simplicity is useful both for academia, where uh, if you can build a simple protocol and uh, do away with all of the complexities, it's really easy to teach and like make students understand that uh, what what the what the core of uh, BFT protocols is when applied to blockchain. And also good for academia because simple protocols are simpler to implement and uh, they are easier to debug, they are easier to test. And at, at some point, if you have to open source your implementation, it would be really easy to uh, you know, uh, attract people that not, uh, really, are not really invested into uh, the theory of distributed systems, but uh, they do want to contribute to your implementation. So that is sort of the motivation behind designing uh, a simple protocol. So let's now jump into Streamlet. So Streamlet works with uh, two assumptions. Uh, the, uh, the first assumption is not really concrete, but it's really uh, done just to simplify the discussion in the paper. However, they do uh, uh, sort of relax these assumptions and uh, provide uh, alternative protocols uh, in the paper as well. So for this, we'll just gonna like uh, assume that this is true and uh, uh, just for the sake of uh, simplifying the discussion. So the assumption is that uh, the, all the nodes in the system have local clocks which are synchronized with all of the clocks in the system. And uh, they basically run in uh, epochs of one second each. So essentially that is to say that all of the nodes would uh, enter the next epoch at the same time. And the second uh, uh, assumption is that uh, the each epoch has a randomly elected leader. Uh, this leader is elected using a publicly available hash function. So uh, I think I have, uh, I read the algorand paper and uh, uh, you can sort of refer to verifiable random functions if you wanna go deeper into like how we would select nodes and in particular uh, a leader in this setting. So now let's now look at some basic definitions uh, to understand Streamlet. Uh, so you have this like uh, Genesis block that is, uh, that is omnipresent in all blockchain discussions. Then you have an actual block. This block can be 
uh, understood by looking at this tuple of values. So the first value is hash of the parent block. Then it also stores the epoch uh, in which this block was added. And uh, then it would have the actual payload that you are trying to uh, you know, commit in a, in a blockchain, which is a, a set of transactions. So this payload is added, uh, this block is added to the, uh, it basically extends the Genesis block. And when a block gets votes from, uh, uh, okay, yeah. So more blocks can be added to extend the blockchain. So if a block, like let's say the block in Epoch 7 receives votes from uh, a majority of honest processes, we basically call that, uh, that, we basically say that that block is notarized. And a chain of notarized blocks is what's called a notarized chain. So with those definitions, uh, also uh, there is a concept of block height. So the epochs no, not, they do not necessarily correspond to the height of the block in the system. So for example, in this, uh, the very next block to the Genesis block is, was added in epoch seven, but it's at a height of, the block height of this particular block is one. So, so that's how it goes in the blockchain. So you have uh, a block in epoch seven at height one and eight at height two and uh, so on. So with these definitions, let's look at the protocol. So the protocol is fairly straightforward as it's intended to be. So in each epoch, the leader creates a new block, again with the hash of the parent block, the epoch that it's a leader of, and it extends the longest notarized chain that that leader has seen so far. And it sends this block to all of the players in the systems or all of the nodes in the system. And the nodes sign the first proposal that they receive in a particular epoch if and only if the block extends the longest notarized chain that the voters have seen so far. And once uh, this process goes on, the main or the, or the core of the protocol is the finalization rule. So when we have a notarized chain as uh, defined in the previous slide. If that notarized chain has at least three consecutive epochs, so it could be one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. So we ignore the last block. So if a chain has four, five, six, we basically say that we're gonna ignore six and finalize the chain that uh, uh, until the penultimate block, essentially. So let's look at this with an example. Let's say we have four honest nodes. Uh, uh, we have a, uh, we shouldn't have said four honest, but let's say there are four nodes in the system and one of them is malicious. So let's say how the protocol would, uh, would apply in, the, in, in this kind of system. So again, we have the Genesis block and uh, let's say we skip the epoch one and in epoch two, we have a block and uh, the leader basically proposes that block. And uh, let's say uh, all of the honest voters uh, vote for that block because hey, it's extended the longest notarized chain. The, uh, the Genesis block is deemed to be notarized by default. So the, the leader would basically now notarize the uh, epoch two block. And again, uh, uh, there could be a network partition. So we could skip over some epochs and let's say the epoch eight is uh, when, the, when another block is added uh, to the, uh, added by the leader of that epoch eight. And then that leader proposes that block again. And uh, let's say it received votes from a, a majority of honest nodes and it notarizes that block. And uh, this process goes on uh, to block nine and 10 are added. Now in this case, we can see that uh, this whole chain that's on the screen is notarized. And we have 
three consecutive epochs. So what I so what we are going to do is essentially uh, ignore the block ten for now and just uh, finalize the rest of the chain. So I'm using this colored green block to show that this block is now finalized. So let's look at another example. Uh, so again, we have the Genesis block. It's considered uh, notarized by default. So let's say a block comes up for epoch one and uh, the leader proposes this block and uh, the voters see that again, it's extending the longest notarized chain and they vote for it. Let's say at this point, there is a network partition and the leader is not able to, uh, uh, to find uh, to notarize this box. So another leader can come up in epoch two and uh, do the same thing, send out this block. The voters still see that uh, uh, the Genesis block is still the longest notarized chain and they vote for it. And uh, this block is, uh, uh, this block is notarized. Now, at some point, the votes for epoch one would uh, epoch one block would reach the leader, and uh, it, it would notarize that. And this process can happen again. So, so something like we can end up with something like this. So here we can see that we can have multiple notarized blocks at the same height. So one and two are notarized and they are the same height uh, and five and three are notarized and they are at the same height. So this is allowed by uh, Streamlab. This is fine. However, something like this is not allowed. Um, we'll see why, but let's just, uh, just, just assume that this is uh, true for the moment. So something like this is not possible. Why? Because if we apply the finalization rule, then this chain would be notarized. But there is another block five at the finalized block uh, that is three. And this is not uh, allowed by the Streamlight protocol. Uh, the reason behind that is that uh, we want to make sure that the chain with the finalized block is the longest one. And that is the only one that's extended. Mohit, uh, can yeah. I ask a question? Can you go mm -hmm. slides back? Mm -hmm. Here? Uh, Wait, I'll just zoom out. And then... This figure yeah. one example. This one? Uh, no, the, let's go this to one? one example. No. There is still a fork. That's what you started showing. Uh, this one? Yep, 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 this one. Okay. So okay. I understand we could have one. Mm -hmm. um, the reason we could have two is, um, so one is notarized, right? Uh, no, not, uh, not at this point when two is added. Oh, but, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, what does notarize mean? Notarize means it gets um, two third um, uh, signatures saying that I have been one, right? Yes. But uh, don't we have this? Uh, okay, that's for liveness. So that says that uh, uh, the messages are messages are delivered and responses are delivered all within the within the round. But yes. this, we could have a fork when that is not uh, satisfied temporarily, right? Yes, yes. And that's why we have one and two different, even though, uh, okay, one and one is not notarized. Yes. Not notarized. Can we go one more? So I'm trying to see if I, we could um, construct this uh, thing by following the longest chain rule that um, Streamlet proposes. Now okay. add the three to one. Mm -hmm. So is one notarized at this point? Yes. Mm. So bo both one and two are notarized. Yes. 
but why would they notarize two? Because it's not extending a notarized chain one, but they didn't know at the time, maybe. Okay. Yes, yes. Then they notarize it because it has higher epoch number and it looks valid. Similar argument, we can make it for three. Three is not notarized yet. And similar argument, we can make it for five, for the fork upwards. Okay, got it, got yes. it. Okay, I just wanted to see if this was... It. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes, okay. So, uh, yeah, so I was saying that uh, to make sure that uh, the, uh, the, the protocol only extends uh, only finalizes the uh, the chain that is the longest one so that any new blocks that are added uh, just extend the finalized chain and not like uh, uh, extend any competing forks. So that is why the finalization rule makes sure uh, that uh, there is no uh, block at the same height for, uh, uh, for the finalized, for the last finalized block. So let's, uh, so we'll uh, look at the consistency rule and the finalization rule, which uh, ensures that. So just for the time being, let's uh, add seven. Uh, uh, I should have not added X here, but just ignore it for a second. So let's say now we add seven and uh, now at this point, uh, two, five, six, and the Genesis block. So the five, six, seven are the consecutive epochs. So now we can essentially uh, we can essentially finalize up to block six, and now we have to uh, prove for consistency that the block uh, which has the X cannot exist. So uh, the authors uh, prove it using uh, uh, three simple lemmas, or or more precisely. Uh, two because third is just a derivative of the second one. So let's look at the first lemma that is pretty straightforward that two different blocks cannot be notarized for the same epoch. So uh, so let's uh, prove this by contradiction that uh, these all both of these blocks or both of these two different blocks are notarized for the same epoch. <coughs> Pardon me. So that would mean that uh, they the total number of votes in for a particular in a particular epoch were four n by three. Now the honest votes would be uh, limited to two n by three because they would only uh, vote uh, once. But there could be just the malicious node that can vote twice. So if we add that up, now we can see that f is assumed to be less than n by three. So by that, we can see that uh, the total number of votes on the left side would be less than four n by three. So there are just not enough votes to uh, notarize both of the blocks for the same epoch. So that is uh, lemma one. So that essentially means that we cannot have a, some, we cannot have a scenario something like this. This can happen. So now let's look at the second case that uh, if we have this chain, then uh, this, this particular block five that is at the same height as six cannot exist. Uh, I should have also, I have a lot of mistakes in the slides. I, sh I should have written X because epoch five is already taken. So let's just assume that X, that's X, but that essentially means that this block cannot exist at the same height as six. So, this is proven by using two cases. First, like that X is less than five or X is greater than seven. So if X is less than five, then that would essentially mean that uh, X equals four. So let's assume that uh, block four uh, is notarized. So that, that it would have received two out of three of the majority votes uh, uh, if, if it has to be notarized. Now the honest, if, if the majority of honest participants uh, vote for four, then it must have, then epoch, they would have seen that epoch three is notarized 
and they would be extending uh, that fork of the chain or the that chain. Then three votes are taken up by the epoch four block. Now, if we try to add epoch five, it just won't be able to get enough votes. So then that case X is less than five is not possible. So now look at the second case where X is greater than seven. So in that case, the block would be uh, for epoch eight. So if epoch seven block got enough votes or a majority of honest participants voted for it. So by same logic, they would have seen that the epoch six block was already notarized. So they would not vote for the epoch eight block. So they, there is not there's just not enough votes to go to epoch eight. So those are essentially the two lemmas and uh, I'm gonna uh, show them here along with a bit of in intuition that goes along with it. So the first lemma was that two different blocks can not be notarized for the same epoch. So what that essentially means is that a single block would be uh, notarized for a given epoch. Uh, then, then the lemma two says that no other block in past or future can share the same height as six. So that basically means that we cannot rewrite history that once a block is so as to say finalized, then, then no other competing chain can be extended. So that uh, ensures uh, this, fun, uh, this intuition. So finally, that uh, the longest notarized chains would be extending six and uh, like by sort of deriving from lemma two, we see that the, the, so the intuition is that there should be a sort of an explosive growth of the chain on a particular fork. So in, if, if the blocks are being added in the, in consecutive epochs, that means that, uh, that that is the chain that would be extended in the future. So then that is the chain that should be finalized. And the folks are sort of dissuaded if you, if you think intuitively. So, yeah, I mean, I did not, uh, th that's pretty much it. I didn't look at the, I didn't uh, add liveness to the presentation, but it's uh, basically, uh, if you think about it, it's just like if a leader is able to be elected in an epoch, then uh, during, uh, if, if a leader is elected during a particular epoch and there is a uh, synchrony, then we can uh, essentially just have liveness. We can continue adding blocks to the chain and the blocks would be confirmed. So yeah, I mean, this was a simple protocol. So the presentation was really short, but that, that's about it. Also, I uh, found this uh, talk given by Ben uh, at, at the Stanford Blockchain Week, and I have like closely followed what he uh, talked about in, in that video. So, if you are interested in sort of having a different explanation, and I think he has explained it really well, you can go check check this uh, YouTube link. And yeah, that's that's pretty much it.